Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. Several hallmark moments dot the landscape on the road to a true and viable holography, that is, a holography so ubiquitous and so accessible that one need not think twice before deploying it in an actionable way. Foremost on the list is Dennis Gabor's invention of holography itself. Gabor earned the 1971 Nobel Prize in Physics for the feat, though he accomplished it decades earlier, in 1947. Approximately a dozen years after Gabor's invention, the development of the laser enabled the creation of three-dimensional holograms. In 1972, the world was introduced to the first multiplex hologram. 1999 saw the first patent awarded for color digital hologram printing using pulsed lasers. While the technology has crawled out of novelty and towards utility, bottlenecks to widespread adoption remain. The sweet spot between resolution and scalability is a target that, so far, has proved just out of reach for industry. Today on All Things Photonics, we introduce you to a company whose holographic chips seek to pair gigapixel resolution with CMOS economics. In our conversation with Swave Photonics founder and chief product officer Theodore Moresco and CEO Mike Noonan, we discuss how Swave's diffractive photonics technology delivers pixel arrays up to 64 gigapixels without venturing outside of the CMOS manufacturing model. This combination and its potential lifted Swave to a first-place finish at the 2023 SPIE Startup Challenge in San Francisco. The IMAX spinout has also been accepted as a member of the next cohort of the Luminate New York Accelerator. Two things to know about Swave are its phase change memory technology, which serves as the heart of its technological offering, and its intentionality in mimicking a semiconductor manufacturing model that aims to bring scalability to the photonic element. As the company forges ahead, it does so with the promise of changing how we perceive the metaverse and how we perceive reality. So we met Swave Photonics really for all intents and purposes at Photonics West during the SPIE Startup Challenge. And that suggests and points to the newness of the company, as well as the fact that there's going to be more to come as we look ahead with the company and its technology offerings. Would you mind describing for us the origin story of the company and how it came to be? Sure. So um, basically, Swave Photonics is a spinoff from uh, iMac. The backstory of holography at IMAX t- started about 10 years ago, uh, when IMAX, you know, has proven that you could do basically, you know, binary holograms with, uh, with semiconductors. And at the time, IMAX was trying to use different pixel technologies. They were looking at MEMS to, uh, to make the holograms happen. And then they realized that MEMS don't really scale because to do holography, you need to be deep sub wavelengths like ideally less than half of the wavelengths of the light impinging on your on your hologram long story short th- that program got you know paused after a few years and has been resumed back in 2015 16 when there were some connections with uh, other research activities uh, within iMac uh, specifically within the memory group that was working on phase change materials and reusing uh, I would say sort of that 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 knowledge and know-how. The the program was put you know back again on steroids and uh, on on a lot of research that you know ultimately led uh, to where Swave is today. The origin story and IMEX role in the origin story is is quite significant, and we talk a lot about the the European R and D model um, versus the U.S. National Lab model, and it's not a, a you know it's sort of a, an apples to oranges may even be generous there. Can you speak to that type of R&D environment and working in that type of establishment and the significance that that environment has on not just the technology, but the company rounding into shape and and taking full as it becomes a, you know, a company that's ready to move into the commercial markets? It has a very interesting model where they are uh, doing research in semiconductors, really like on the next nodes and, 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 you know, typically five to 10 years in advance of the needs of, of, the, of the industry. And in that research, they're joined by uh, the largest semiconductor companies 
in in the world and and you know many many other partners from time to time some of that research that is you know really at the edge doesn't necessarily fit into those programs and it's it's a better fit to to be spun into a a spit off which is you know what happened uh, here with the uh, with the diffractive photonics technology that is being used at uh, at Swave we will get into the diffractive technology here momentarily, but you mentioned semiconductor, and that's that, that plays an interesting role. That notion plays an interesting role in Swave, and that's a distinguishing characteristic, in fact, of Swave's technology insofar as fabrication and scalability are concerned. And Mike, you've mentioned this, the way that Swave aims to leverage sort of a semiconductor model and apply it to an optical element. What about that model? The semiconductor model has worked for Swave, or, or I suppose more relevantly, the Swave attempt to leverage. And uh, you really hit on uh, you know one of I think you know the the areas of leverage, and by you know tapping into uh, you know an entirely different uh, you know cost model and uh, and really being on you know the semiconductor path as opposed to you know the uh, much different uh, you know both path as well as uh, you know kind of fundamental economics. So. Uh, you know, optics. So, uh, you know, uh, and we've seen this in other areas, you know, there's no Moore's law for batteries, for instance. And so, you know, semiconductors have been, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, a, a, a force, you know, unto themselves, but also, you know, bring an economies of scale, you know, to other disciplines that haven't enjoyed, you know, the, the, the same, you know, I guess, you know, pace of innovation. And by taking, you know, so much of the complexity that, you know, previously had been either in the do- domain of, uh, you know, uh, you know, purely optics or, or just, you know, one, I guess, you know, tool in the toolbox, and uh, you were able to, you know, rethink, you know, a solution, uh, but put it on a, a different cost basis. And in this case, you know, both CMOS cost basis, you know, that really uh, allows us, you know, to, to move something, you know, forward, you know, much faster. Uh, and it also turns out to, uh, you know, make uh, dramatic improvements along the, you know, the, the, the same way. And, uh, and it really is, you know, to the brilliance of IMAC to have that broad perspective you know, to see how, you know, something, you know, in the, the domain of photonics and optics actually could be, you know, well addressed by, you know, the semiconductor tools that they're so, you know, uh, familiar with and really have pioneered. And now Swave is, uh, they were saying is, you know, formed to, you know, to spin that out and then productize it and really take it to the next level. I do promise that we will get into the technology, and I think that will that will make a um, a lot of sense out of what we're talking about here early in the conversation. But to sort of follow up on on what you've just spoken to, you can't force something like vertical integration. The semiconductor model has had that. How specifically does Swave attempt to leverage that model? Because there are certain things that the semiconductor model had that even you know if the model itself was a person probably couldn't have hoped for. It's been a really effective mechanism. That's right. That's right. Well, and, uh, you know, being able to leverage, you know, what, uh, you know, has been, you know, formed over the past, you know, really half century, you know, in terms of, you know, a, an asset light and, you know, and becoming, you know, fabulous, uh, you know, this allows us to tap into, you know, not only the, you know, the pre-competitive research that, uh, you know, that IMEC has you know, pioneered, but also leverage the manufacturing prowess, you know, that really has enabled, you know, the, the semiconductor, you know, you know, business itself, you know, to be, you know, a half trillion and, and, and growing. And, you know, and, and really being you know, at the core of, you know, just about, you know, basically every business. And, and, uh, and that really is, you know, the, the interesting, I guess, so, uh, you know, journey that we're on, you know, to be able to, you know, tap into, you know, what is, you know, the cumulative, you know, I guess, so, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, uh, investment as well as, you know, uh, understanding how to get the, the best leverage. And especially when it comes to emerging technologies like the one that we're, we're deploying, uh, you know, being able to move, move that, you know, very quickly because, you know, so much of the, the fundamental research has been done, which allows us, you know, to uh, to move to productization much quicker than perhaps would have ever been done in a you know a, a, a vertical and you know when uh, you, you you basically had to do all the heavy lifting yourself. To better grasp Swave's technology and its impact, we turn to Theodore Moresco to deliver a more comprehensive review of holography and holography applications. It is here that the notions of pixel pitch and diffraction enter our conversation. Using phase change memory innovations transplanted from IMAX work in material science and adopted for scalable holography, Swave isn't reinventing so much as it is re-innovating. Also, pay attention too to Moresco's mention of MEMS technology. So holography has been discovered, invented in the 1950s, 1940s, and it was a theoretical discovery 
And actually, we had to wait until the laser was invented to actually prove that in, in reality. And you had the Nobel Prize in 1971. Now, there are, since, you know, the 70s, there are photographic plates that can display holograms. That's something that is that is quite common. Now, we have not seen video holograms to date. And one of the main reasons is that what you have on a photographic uh, plate is an incredibly small, if you like, pixel pitch, you know, into the deposited atoms of, of silver on, on there. Because holography is based uh, on diffractive optics. It's actually based on the uh, interference of multiple light waves. So to create one point in space, we have multiple basically spherical waves that interfere with one another. And if you can control how these spherical waves are interfering with one another, you can create that light point. Now, to be able to diffract the wave efficiently, the, the laser light that you're going to put on it has to be impinging on uh, something that is smaller than the wavelengths actually even ideally smaller than half of the wavelengths. That's when you're actually going to have a large field of view. And there is a very steep relationship between pixel pitch and field of view. So for all practical purposes, holograms really become effective when you are, I would say, you know, under 250 nanometers. Now, 250 nanometers pixel pitch uh, this is something that is unheard of with the current technologies. Like at best today, you would find something at, you know, two, two and a half micron. And that's the case for all of the technologies that we, you know, commonly know of. Speaking about MEMS, micro LEDs, LCOS, and, and, and you name them. Coming from IMEC, we also have, I would say, the uh, advantage of having an insight into these technologies. And we know that none of them has a roadmap to scale below one micrometer. So basically, until now, there wasn't a, uh, a switchable pixel technology uh, that would allow to do holography in any meaningful way beyond very small, beyond very uh, small fields of view. And that's really where the innovation from IMEC came into uh, reusing technologies that are not unlike uh, some of the phase change memories out there, uh, relying on, on materials that effectively change physical phase. To, to change their optical parameters. And this is what we are uh, leveraging and industrializing into the uh, uh, holographic extended reality chips that uh, Sway Photonics is, uh, is developing. A big part of this is a uh, spatial light modulator. That is the element um, of which we have spoken. What is, and I, I always hesitate to ask this question, um, because I often know the answer I'm going to get. Um, I'll use the phrase secret sauce and, and feel free to tell me as much or as little as you're comfortable saying. What enables the spatial light modulator to be as critical to your technology as it is, I suppose, is a good way to ask the question. It's the ability to use 95% standard CMOS process with some secret sauce on top of it to make these very, very small light modulators. And having these very small light modulators allows you two things. Uh, on the one hand, you get very good diffraction efficiency and you get very good holography. On the other hand, we have at least two orders of magnitude higher density than any other pixel technology on, on the planet. And that allows on, uh, I would say, on the, on the same silicon real estate to pack a lot more information, which is also something that you need to, to, display, a, to display a hologram. And, you know, the advantages of holograms is that you have uh, the full 3D image in all directions of space, perfect analog, horizontal and vertical parallax. So you can see around objects or behind objects if you're moving your head. But you also have this perfect depth of focus. So you can focus on objects that are close by to your eye as well as objects that are far away from your eye. And having this kind of analog transition in the focus that is really so essential in, in, in many of the applications. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically looks like, like you know, natural, natural life. It also removes the virgin accommodation conflict, so we're basically not making our, our customers sick. It's, a, it's very rare that you have, you know, such a huge breakthrough in one domain, but turns out to be able to, to leverage, and as we were just talking about, you know, very mature, you know, scalable technologies. And, you know, and that really is, you know, the combination, you know, is the, you know, the, the, the secret, to, I guess, so, you know, uh, your benefit uh, that we, you know, intend and in, in this podcast will definitely help, you know, making it not so secret. And, uh, but, you know, very, very rare. We have such a huge leap forward 
but still be able to uh, to leverage you know very scalable and uh, and again very mature technologies. Right. And Theo, I think one of the things that you've done, um, and it will be quite helpful to our listeners, I think, as we move as they move along and listening to the podcast, is you've talked about the growth trajectory of, of holographic technology, and now as that feeds into things like AR, VR, and MR, it takes on a, a new kind of relevancy. The holographic ships that Swave is working on, working toward, working with. Does that feel like, in, in a sort of the, the next wave technology evolution for holography? Um, and I ask because anyone who is at Photonics West, it may be stepped into the ARV or MR conference. That is the 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 bottleneck in need of resolution, and your technology aims to resolve that bottleneck. It, I guess the question here for me is: At what point did that appear to you to be the problem that needed to be resolved? The, the scalability model. I think there, there are many problems to be resolved, and, and I think scalability is one of them, and, and we can talk to it. But I think the um, very important advantages of holography over traditional uh, optical displays are, well, you mentioned it, you know, higher, higher, higher resolution, higher field of view. But with holography, we, we have this um, very yeah, wide depth of field which allows us to have these objects close by and far away without any form of eye tracking and, and you know, without any, any complex systems. And that allows also removing the vergence and composition conflict because when I'm, you know, my, when my eyes converge on the object to see its depth, I'm also focusing really on that object. I'm not focusing somewhere else on a screen uh, and, and sending these conflicting signals to my brain. So holography solves the focus problem. It solves the vergence accommodation problem. But it has also some other, uh, I would say, maybe not intuitive properties. With holography, you're able to put your resolution where you need it in space. So we can concentrate resolutions in the area where we need it, which also means that we can concentrate uh, the amount of energy in the areas where we need it. And that gives you a high dynamic range, which is very important for perception. So I can have very bright areas and, and very dim areas. Uh, same thing with the, with the color bit depth. We can put where, where the information about color where we actually need it. And, and re- really with holography, you're sculpting a light wave. So in the, in the situations where you're still having like a head mounted display, because that might be convenient, you don't need a, a head mounted dis- display to do stereoscopy, but it might, it might be convenient. In those cases, we can also do things like uh, optical correction, a uh, correction for prescription, because we can actually modulate that, uh, that light wave. So there are many, many advantages over traditional techniques. The scaling comes on top of it. The scaling allows you to have higher density, on a smaller chip, which can of course be beneficial for cost, but it's also beneficial for being able to integrate it to very lightweight and very small systems. Um, to, to give you a, a ballpark, our prototype chips are designed with a 50 uh, to 50 nanometer pixel pitch, which means that if you have a four by four millimeter, you know, millimeter area, active area, you're already at 256 megapixels. To, to, to bring that information, that four by four millimeter uh, active area can, can fit into, uh, into glasses, in, you know, in, in, into glass frames. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned some of the applications that you mentioned. Even something like perception is a much uh, is a helpful word because I think when you're talking about AR, uh, VR, MR, uh, you can go off course and into just novelty without practicality very quickly. Uh, and, and that's an exciting risk, but it is a risk. When you talk about or when you hear about AR, VR, and MR, what are the applications that come to mind right away for you? Yeah, I've been involved in you know the the world of you know video communications you know for 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 many years you know going back to you know plain old telephone service, and uh, and so you know just the you know straightforward one you know adding you know more information and you know and and immersion when it comes to you know just communications in general you know becomes you know I think a kind of a a foundational application, and you know, will that you know show up in you know not only uh, you know to, to you know, kind of be the next uh, you know, evolution of you know now you know a Zoom and a Teams and a, and a WebEx world, you know, most definitely, and, and in fact you know we're already seeing you know those companies you know start to talk about holographic like 
you know, application to, again, to, to add more, you know, I guess, so uh, you know, interaction you know, to something that is, you know, going to be, you know, part of how we, you know, you know, live, work and play, you know, from on now. But that, that becomes now something that, you know, I think both informs as well as in enhancing, you know, so many verticals, you know, whether it be, you know, from a, a medical standpoint or whether it be from an, an advertising standpoint. And then, and then of course, uh, you know, obviously, and, and, and perhaps so, uh, you know, com- coming back to some of its origins, you know, gaming and just entertainment. And so, you know, just in general, you know, we're adding more information, you know, to, uh, to something that, you know, now uh, has become, you know, very much uh, you know, part of our, our, our lives. And, uh, and, uh, and we know, you know that, that basically, uh, you know, when there's more information, you, know, you end up with more utility and more capability, uh, as well as a, more of a level playing field. And, uh, and that's what, uh, you know, being able to move to your know, true holography, you know, uh, you know, has uh, you know, not only the, the benefit, but I think it's going to also then enable all sorts of you know, other applications that we haven't thought about uh, you know, just yet. And uh, because this enabling technology has added so much more, but doing it in, in a, a cost basis that's also going to be much more accessible and perhaps so uh, your know, solutions that uh, have been uh, you know, very cleverly you know, engineered uh, you know, weren't able to, uh, to meet that scalability you know, challenge. And you mentioned more, and you mentioned it several times, more is exciting. It also can lead to um, more criticality in terms of the eye with which some of these technologies are viewed. Um, and I think whenever the conversation arrives at the notion of making reality indistinguishable from – or making virtual reality indistinguishable from reality, there is this issue of ethics that not everyone raises, thank goodness, but, but some do. Uh, and it's often those who don't quite – know the technology um, or understand some of the um, more beneficial uses of the technology. Do you have a pitch to someone who might raise such a concern, either of you? Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about making images that are going to be a lot more natural is that um, this is the way we're communicating. yeah, and And this is establishing a form of trust. You know, if I'm talking to to my neighbor, I will establish that that form of trust. Now, your question, I think, ties a little bit into, okay, what happens if I have, you know, this natural level of trust that the natural images are, are creating and can somebody fool me? And yes, but I think this is where, in my mind, uh, the AR, VR is actually connecting to the blockchain technology. What blockchain brings you is a peer-to-peer system for trust in general. Without going into the, te- the technicalities, that in my mind, that's what blockchain brings you. It's a way with somebody else to do a transaction that you can rely on and, and that you can believe in. So I think the combination of both more advanced imaging and and basically blockchain will create this this trust relationship that is actually enhanced by the more natural uh, more natural images i think it, you, you bring up a great point and you know all of these technologies don't exist in a vacuum and you know by you know, interlinking your know, things that you are you know, uh, your tools to you know, help us, you know, establish more trust. And really that chain of trust you know, is, is going to be you know, essential to move forward. But the other aspect and, and one, one aspect of, you know, the ethical deployment of, of technology is accessibility. And if, you know, these advanced tools are only available to, you know, those who can afford, you know, something that's, you know, you know either very expensive or scarce, uh, you know, I think that undermines, you know, a, both a level of trust as well as a, you know, a level playing field. Uh, and, you know, by na- being able to, you know, uh, move to a different cost basis, as well as, you know, uh, uh, being able to, to free up technology in a variety of form factors, uh, you know, I think this will be you know, something that uh, you know, doesn't uh, end up having, you know, uh, you know, pockets of you know, inequality, you know, when it comes to, you know, the deployment of technology. It's always interesting to hear how a company settles on its preferred blend of technology. For all the time that a company devotes to optimizing its offering, the journey to that point is itself arduous and revealing. For Swave, micro-LEDs and MEMS are two areas that the company simply could not ignore as it ultimately arrived at its HXR microchip technology. Scalability, Maresco says, posed limits in these particular areas. Those limits represented non-starters. Still, he doesn't discount the recent progress made, most notably to micro-LEDs, as we draw ever closer to the metaverse. Hard to imagine that the sort of formative R&D took place um, without consideration of the potential of things like MEMS 
or even modems, I guess, would be fair games. Mike Rowley, D technology probably would be at least in some sort of conversation. Um, are these technologies that Sway have considered before sort of arriving at the secret sauce of which we spoke? Yes. So I think some of the formative technologies in, you know, looking into holography uh, were were made based on MEMS. Uh, so this is something that I've alluded to earlier on. Uh, the, the, back in 2009, 2010, iMac was looking into, uh, you know, bringing technology like the one is integrated by Swave, and they were looking at MEMS at the time. And they have realized that that particular technology doesn't really scale to, to, to sub wavelengths. Uh, and they looked at other technologies like micro LEDs, like LCOS. And I mean, for their understanding, our understanding, these technologies don't scale below one micrometer. They, they don't have a roadmap to do that. So, you know, I would say that these technologies are not really ideal to, to go and, and, and do holography. That said, some of the recent developments around micro LEDs and other other types of LEDs uh, could be potentially very interesting to use as, as light sources. I have a two-part question to wrap up our conversation. Um, first part is your vision um, your, or your expectation, I suppose, for the metaverse in the next 5, 10, 20 years' time. And then within that, uh, how does Sway factor into that? What's that dynamic? I see the metaverse as the future of the internet. I think it might be just a, a big, a big complicated term to say the future of the internet. But I think that future of the internet has three elements into it that we don't have today. Uh, one of these elements is the augmented reality, extended reality, uh, having these images that look a lot more natural and, and facilitates uh, communication. I believe it has that element of blockchain and, and the reason in, in my mind the element of blockchain is there is to, to, to help with the trust to transactions. The AR, MR is enhancing the trust between people to, in, in a more natural way, but they might be at the, at the other side of the planet. And the third element is uh, artificial intelligence. I expect that uh, we will... You know, the way that we all have a smartphone in our pocket, we will all have an assistant, an AI assistant with us, you know, in whichever form at the edge on the cloud. And that AI is more than just an agenda and a way to search uh, the Internet. That is actually generating content and that's generating bespoke content both audio and video and, and, and obviously, you know, fundamentally holographic uh, content for entertainment or for any kind of uh, uh, other, other purposes. And, you know, and the picture that we're painting and, you know, what Phil kind of outlined, you know, uh, I think it really enables, uh, you know, being able to tap into all of these capabilities without, you know, being, you know, necessarily, you know, either encumbered or tethered. And, you know, and, and we've seen, you know, what happens when, you know, you start to, you know, uh, you know, decouple, you know, whether it be, you know, from, uh, you know, a, a goggle apparatus or perhaps, you know, some sort of, you know, wire, uh, you know, now all sorts of, you know, both the uh, you know, applications as well as usage models, you know, start to, uh, you know, to evolve. And, you know, by being able to move to true holography and do it in a way that becomes, you know, enabling or perhaps you know, liberating, you know, when it comes to form factors and so forth. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be, you know, not only this explosion of, you know, uh, your usage models, uh, but also, you know, perhaps you know, a higher level of interaction uh, w without feeling like you know, you're you know, uh, isolated or perhaps you know, in this you know, virtual world uh, you know, you know, together but all alone. Uh, and, and that's you know, the you know, goggles free you know, potential that uh, you know, we're, uh, we're enabling and, and really you know, true holography is, is enabling. And, uh, and that, I think, is going to be, you know, you know, both very exciting for Swave, but, uh, but for our partners and for, you know, uh, where, how this evolves uh, over the next you know, several years. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com.